Very good evening, one and all, and welcome to the special Tortoise Thinking with the one and only John Amici. I'm Matt Dancona, I'm an editor here at Tortoise, and it is a great pleasure to welcome John and you all to this, our penultimate um, gathering before we break up for August. Um, we're asking where have all the great leaders gone? And as ever, we want to hear from you all um, at the helm in the chat this evening, who better is Mark St. Andrew. So please do send over your ideas and observations there. And we hope to uh, bring you in later in the conversation. Now I could spend the entire hour, we have allotted listing John's accomplishments. Um, so I hope you'll forgive me if I uh, summarize as I must. Um, in his remarkable MBA career, John, um, Signed with the Cleveland Cavaliers in 96, uh, 1995, I believe, and uh, played for teams, including the Orlando Magic, before completing his career at the Knicks in 2004. He is an Olympic medalist, he is a distinguished psychologist, and he is founder of the highly successful consultancy Amici Performance Systems APS. Uh, and his counsel and guidance is sought by leaders all over the world. And um, he has distilled some of that wisdom in his new book, Promises of Giants, which I recommend very strongly indeed. I, I've only read it in electronic form, otherwise I would be branching it now. Uh, I, I hope John has a copy. There it is. Buy it. It's brilliant. Um, and you'll learn a lot for it. I, I, I guarantee it. I certainly did. We're very fortunate to have him with us this evening. He's a busy man. Uh, welcome, John. Thank you so much, Matt. I just um, want to say one thing before we continue. Of course. You said Olympic medalist, and I just want to be very clear. That never happened. Um, I won a Commonwealth Games medal, and whilst um, I think we can all agree that that's not even close. Well, I, I'm, I'm still I'm still in awe, uh, but uh, there you go. Thank you for correcting that. <laughs> not particularly important distinction in my view, but still. Um, let me just dive straight in, though, John, um, to the book and its themes, and 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 it, uh, what I see is its enormous traction. In, in, in the world broadly. Um, it, it's about being a giant, both figuratively and literally. And you say very early on in the book, to quote you, that this brings responsibilities as well as strengths. And you say, like Superman, I treat the world as if it's made of cardboard so that I don't accidentally tear it, which I thought was a wonderful uh, way of describing it. Can you elaborate on what that means and what that's like? Yeah, I think, so I have the advantage of being an actual giant, although I am trapped in the, the phantom zone at the moment, and so you, people can't tell. I am six foot nine, I am 24 and a half stone. I am the largest person most of you will have ever met. And I am always acutely aware of the fact that I'm disproportionately powerful. In every interaction, virtual or in person, I have an impact. I, I haven't shouted in 30 years in the presence of a, another person. I, I love to shout. I shout in my house a lot. Um, but I don't shout because I'm aware that even when I talk, the room rumbles. Uh, and when I shout, the earth shakes and people can't perform when they don't feel safe. There's just this, there's this necessary vigilance that comes when you realize that you are disproportionately powerful, when you realize you're a giant. That's what we need from more leaders to realize that. I mean, let, let's think about what's happening in the world right now, how the careless words of world leaders have ramification for the human rights of citizens, have ramifications for our view on the undocumented, have ramifications for our view on lots of things from the loose lips of leaders. Whereas I know that even as I am you know, kind of extemporizing here, I have to be aware that anything I say could have this disproportionate impact on the people listening. So there's that, there's that sense of responsibility that comes with, um, I mean, being a giant in every, in every sense. And I think that leads on to what I, what I think is, for me anyway, one of the great strengths of the book, which is that in, in, although it is framed around 14 promises, it really, its essence is an attempt to sort of, uh, find out what's at the very core of leadership and it relies um or, or it minds to a considerable and often very moving extent to the influence of your late mother and um you 
one of the things she she said to you is um would you recognize your soul in the dark and that for me was a kind of you know you know moment of, of metaphoric underlining note taking what does that mean i need to find out more can you explain what that meant to you and what it might mean to leaders or prospective leaders that, that you were advising yeah i mean full disclosure with the book it is it is to a large extent borrowed wisdom um, the thing i love about the book is that people who read it will get to you'll get to meet my mum um and she was amazing so would you recognize your soul in the dark um she told me this when i told her i was going to play in the nba as a fat kid from stockport whose whose only real impetus in life was reading books especially science fiction and eating greg's steak slices that that pretty much describes my childhood when i told her from that foundation i was going to play in the nba having played basketball for all of 45 minutes at that point. That was the question she asked. Would you recognize, it's so frustrating. I was so, I was so mad at her because I told her this profound thing about this thing I was going to achieve in the future. And she asked me, would I recognize my soul in the dark? And she said, son, people who want to do ordinary things. And by that, she wasn't being pejorative. She meant things that have a well-trodden path like if I had just decided I wanted to go to the University of Leeds and become a psychologist, that's a well-trodden path. It's not without peril, it's not without risk, it's not without effort, but it's really well illuminated. That kind of person doesn't have to worry about what they've got inside them that might sabotage them as much as somebody who is hacking their way through the undergrowth, doing something that others deem impossible. She used to tell me all the time, even as a quite young child, too young to probably understand properly, that most people spend their entire lives figuring out what they're going to do, and they spend no time in their lives wondering about who they're going to become. One of the greatest things that helped me get to where I am now, through the MBA and into this job as a psychologist, is the revelation that I am just extraordinarily lazy. It was such a boon for me. It was really disappointing when I kind of did some introspection and realized me lazy. It doesn't really feel like it's the kind of foundation for huge success. But once I had that, I could build frameworks. I could build structures so that it would never be the thing that derailed me. It suits me to this day. My life is scheduled to a T in an online diary. When it beeps, I move. And because of that, I mean, the only reason I have that structure in place is because I'm aware that without it, my tendency is to sit back, chill, do the least possible work. Some of you may resonate with that. It's fascinating because the, the, the modern sort of populist model of leadership is to, uh, as it were, mold yourself to a series of um, completely extraneous facts. What you're telling us, John, I think, is that the, the starting point of real leadership lies in a pretty radical exercise in self-knowledge, correct? Yeah, it's about introspection. Uh, you mentioned, uh, although there's 14 promises in the book, they are split, not evenly, perhaps proportionately, into introspection, the ability to look at ourselves and really have a, a mastery of who we are, good and bad interpersonal our ability to interact with others in a way that is authentic in a way that is empathic in a way that does no harm and and then organizational how we interact with our organizations but the first part of that the introspection seems to me the piece that is most profoundly missing from the leaders we witness and i mean and that is compounded by the fact that we are working off a a template for leadership that is so old-fashioned as to be redundant this strong man archetype and it is a man archetype it's just completely ridiculous the idea that you have to be completely certain in what you do the idea that you do not collaborate in any meaningful way most people's idea of collaboration as far as i've witnessed looking at workplaces is a uh, the leader in the room pontificating in front of a whiteboard and asking everybody else to nod in agreement the idea that you are invulnerable, you never show any weakness, and omniscient, you know everything. It's just the worst kind of 
leader. It's a leader of the past. It's not a leader of the future. Yes, it, it, it sort of, the, the, the book as a whole reminded me almost of, of it was almost like a, a Hippocratic Oath um, for leaders, it, 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 much, much as doctors have a Hippocratic Oath. There was a kind of um, a covenant between um, the leadership, the leader themselves and the people that they lead, which is, is much more subtle than the kind of leadership writing that uh, the old fashioned leadership writing that you're describing. Um, it's, it's interesting as well, because when you look at the, the way in which a lot of leadership uh, writing is, is framed, it, it's framed in a quite uh, fairly sort of callow way about around niceness, absence or, or, pre or presence of. And you take issue with the word, there's a lot about the role of emotion in the book, a lot. When you take particular issue and very precise issue with the word nice. Can you tell us why? Yeah, I dislike it intensely. Um, again, as, as a child, I mean, forget, even before I do that, I tend to answer every question with a story, apologies. So, nice. Each one of you will have had the experience of being given a gift birthday, holiday, some other festival. And you receive this gift from somebody and you look at it and you open it excitedly and you open it and you've got that fixed look on your face and you say, Patricia, sorry, you're in the middle of my screen, I can see you. Patricia, thank you. This is nice. There is no adult in any proximity to you that doesn't realize instantly that what you mean is, hi, this gift makes it clear you don't know me. This gift, if you do know me, is one that is supposed to inspire contempt. And the moment you leave, I'm going to rewrap this and give it to someone I care equally little about. That's what nice is all about. It's so banal. If someone's done something truly wonderful for you, truly good for you, and the best you can muster is nice, you're not trying hard enough. It, and also, just when it comes to the research, I would point out, Matt, there isn't one iota of research that suggests a link between niceness and performance. So yeah. it's not even useful on that part. No, indeed. Uh, although uh, you, you, I, I would emphasize to people that the, this is the, 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 the kind of detachment from niceness leads into a much more interesting um, analysis of, of, of emotional labor and, 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 and things like that. So. Um, Again, though, you know, to, 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 there's, there's some, some wonderful um, overhaul of the, uh, 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 subversions of orthodoxies. So you talk about the very close affinity in your view between boldness and vulnerability. Now, that is completely uh, contrary to what might be seen as the dominant way of looking at leadership you know that boldness is is being invulnerable but you say being bold in the face of a challenge and allowing yourself to be vulnerable in the face of potential loss opens up an entire spectrum of possibilities that would not otherwise be available that's a huge statement about leadership and I, yes. it really it really you know that that again that was one to write down so i just wondered if you could kind of um flesh it out and explain how in practical terms that that works yeah i i struggle with this uh, a lot in writing because i felt like many people would feel it a bit of a car crash of a juxtaposition it just wouldn't work in their brains and it, but it, the more i looked at it boldness on its own lends itself to recklessness a recklessness about strategy about objectives and outcomes but also about the people whether it be your customers your clients your students or, or your colleagues vulnerability on its own can often lead to meekness a detachment uh, an avoidance of the necessary risk of connection with people but together they seem to reach i don't know if it's an equilibrium but together it seems that you can really stretch yourself whilst understanding that there is a, um, there are limits while understanding that you don't know everything enabling curiosity in, in terms of your interactions with other people 
I've never understood people who want leaders who are omniscient and invulnerable, who know everything and can't be harmed, because the kind of leader who attract uh, the kind of leader who is invulnerable attracts the kind of follower who never expects to have to step up and, and defend them. The kind of leader who is omniscient, who knows everything, attracts the kind of follower who never expects to have to contribute. In the book, I give the example of, if you've ever watched the David Attenborough Blue Planet type things, and you see the sharks or the big rays underwater, invariably they have attached to them these fish that have suckers on their heads, remora. The invulnerable, omniscient leaders attract followers who are like remora. They do nothing more than add drag and eat the scraps and that and that sort of led, led me to uh, a, a quite contemporary reflection which was that what one of the problems of i think uh, looking at political leadership what passes for political leadership is that it is wholly based now on various degrees of bombast but what was interesting is that we've just been through a national experience with the euros where we had figures you know, not just Gareth Southgate, but some of the players, you know, very young men, Marcus Rashford, Raheem Sterling and so on, who were genuinely providing um, national leadership. And, and part of that was, spoke to your point about being ready to show vulnerability, particularly on the morning after the final. And that made me ask a question, which was, is the sporting world, which obviously you know incredibly well, at, further ahead than other sectors in understanding this? No. <laughs> Sport, people won't like this, but it is true. And it isn't true because I said so. There's a wonderful man called Professor Fred Coulter. You should look him up, he's amazing. Um, the kind of person who's who's kind of mildness of approach belies this epic brain. And he, he um, when he was at the University of Stirling, actually did the efficacy studies for, for, the, for the government on sport relief, on, on some of these sport for development things. And he is a better scientist than I in that he used the most sciencey language to tell us that sport, the, 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 the idea that sports teaches lessons is equivocal at best which is what a scientist would say if they mean it's not real. Sport's an empty vessel, it teaches what you make it teach. Every person who says sport taught me to be, without sport I wouldn't be, you can tie that to a person, always, or people. Is it teammates, is it a coach, is it a parent who supported, is it a carer, it doesn't matter, you can tie it to a person because sport's an empty vessel. Any lesson you can learn through football, you can learn through Zumba, you can learn through chess, it's an empty vessel. That being said, I don't know much about football because I'm not a sports fan. The last football game I went to was in 1976. But I was made aware of Marcus Rashford last summer when he facilitated hungry children eating, where he stood against a government to facilitate hungry children eating. Some of us in our career will look back at that time in 1997 when I scored over Shaq. That never happened. But some of us will look back on some story and he's going to look back when he's my age and say, well, he won't because he's too humble to say it, but he'll look back and say, do you remember the summer when children ate because I stood up? It's a great platform, certain sports, football, rugby, others. It's a great platform for leaders yeah. to stand up. But, uh, but 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 uh, no, I take your point that it's not um, it's not systemic to sport to sport itself. Um, another another theme which is uh, you know much discussed in the context of uh, leaders and how they're formed and, and and perhaps malformed is social media. And you talk very interestingly about the the problem of the pursuit of likes and status on social media can be confused with understanding the complexity of the tasks of leadership. And I think this is, this is true of leadership at every level of life. Um, 
what, what if anything can we do about that? Is, is it just, a, is it a question of just being aware of that reality? I, I think we have to be just aware of that reality. Social media is now just another channel uh, for communication. It's a valuable one when used wisely. It is difficult to transmit nuance, guile. It, it's hard irony. It's hard to transmit some of these things, or at least for me, through social media. And so we have to be more careful and more explicit. It's also, um, it's certainly a, a platform where you can be tempted into sophistry. You, you can be tempted into that pithy quote that's supposed to mean something, but is really empty. And, and of course, it's also full of people who think that leadership is a listicle that it's it's something I should tell you you know what you need to do Matt all you have to do is get up at five o'clock in the morning do some yoga beforehand drink I don't know what is it now water with lemon or turmeric or some nonsense and then you're a leader it, and it misses the fact that most of leadership is deeply mundane and it's as mundane as it is vital and and that is hard to transmit through social media I use video um, short videos of my Jedi reflections is what I do, but I, it's the best I've come up with so far. Yes, and I, I, as a fellow Star Wars fanatic, I greatly appreciated your references to Obi Wan and others throughout the book. It's a uh, uh, very, very well made. Um, I wanted to look a little bit about. Uh, you, you have some very penetrating things to say about the whole world of diversity and inclusion and crucially the difference between the two uh, starting with um, a very clear rejection of the notion of unconscious, un unconscious bias which is fascinating because particularly in the wake of the horrific murder of George Floyd there was a, a sort of massive um, sort of uh, everyone swallowed in one gulp you know the work of people like D'Angelo on white fragility and 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 so on, Peggy McIntosh, and unconscious bias training zoomed up as a kind of priority. Now, I, I'm very interested in your your take on unconscious bias, but also the, the, the distinction you draw between D and I. And mm. I think in any leadership uh, context, these are massively important issues. So, can you can you Take us by the hand and walk us through it a bit. Let's start with the the DNI distinction. I think so. Our methods for understanding and measuring inclusion are blunt uh, because it's there. There are good sciencey, simplistic sciencey ways of doing it, but most organisations choose not to invest in that, and they don't have the HR infrastructure, frankly, to measure accurately who's in. And they haven't created environments where everybody wants to disclose, you know, where there, where people in workplaces want to tell people, I'm a black person, I'm a gay person, I'm a whatever else. But broadly, diversity is simply the presence of difference. The reason it's crucial to understand that that's not inclusion is because the presence of difference has never equaled access to the brilliance of difference. Just because you have someone who is different in your environment doesn't mean that you'll get access to the amazing stuff. My team, I'm weird. Um, this is not a pejorative. I'm a weirdo. It's amazing. My team is a team of weirdos. They're amazing. We have a sign on our wall, a neon sign that says weird and wonderful. And I love it. We, we, we embrace this. And I tell everybody who joins our team, I need to know what's going on in here. We've got some ways of working. You tell me how I can best access this. You're an introvert who doesn't want to stick your hand up in your first six weeks of being here. Completely understand. How can we make that happen? Inclusion is effortful. It's, it's, it's an individual effortful thing. And in terms of an organization, an inclusive culture well, this is something I've said often, and so people will be bored of it by this time, but an inclusive culture is not defined by your rejection of the egregious, right? You know those organizations that say, look how good we are. We've thrown out that guy who's been rubbing the shoulders of women for the last 30 years. Oh, that makes us good. Or, or those people who think it's like, well, nobody's doing anything illegal. That compliance point of view, that makes it inclusive. But it's not. Inclusion 
is about the worst behavior you tolerate as an individual. That's, that's what defines it. When you sit in a meeting and somebody is able to say something uncivil and nobody says anything, that's what defines the culture. So inclusion is this effortful thing. It, it, it's about purposefully inconveniencing yourself so that others can express their brilliance. And, 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 and you're, you're quite clear that, that, that culture is, uh, is, a, is about taking decisions and, and enactments rather than just some vague series of commitments, correct? Yeah, it, it, it's about, it's, there's nothing vague about it. It's about telling people what you stand for. In yeah. the Because inclusion isn't just about protected categories. But if we were talking about protect, protected categories, it's about a leader, not a name, to, that's not about a name or a title, that, not about a role, that's about your, it's about your the experience that you are going to demand for other people around you. It's about leaders saying, for, for protected characteristics, if racism is here, here is the fence, and I am here. But I'm not here kind of hoping that racism dies. I am here figuring out how to destroy it with fire. If sexism is here, fence me. Homophobia, fence me. Anti-Semitism, fence me, fire. Islamophobia, fence me, fire. And then you say, test me. Test me on Zoom. Test me in the queue for Pret. Test me on the tube side. Test me. That's what builds a culture of inclusion. So, I want to try a little uh, unusual thing for a, a, a thinking, which is to just show a quick clip. And the, the reason uh, I'm doing this is because one, one of the most powerful uh, bits of your book and that's saying something John is is the description of a, an event that happened at the uh, 2017 London Marathon and um, Connor I wonder if you can just play the video because I don't want to uh, influence what people think just want to watch them to watch and, and then jump well, that Swansea Harrier probably won't know that Josh Griffiths has qualified for the world championships and look at him he's saying come on it's there you can do it you can do it brilliant this is so hard. I mean, this every single part of his body is shutting down on him. But what we're seeing also is the camaraderie and the spirit of the marathon. How many of these guys are on for their personal best? They want to break that time, but they're still running by to see if they can help him. Of course, they don't know if they can actually help him all the way to the line, but they can certainly encourage him. And let's just hope he's OK. And there's some help waiting for him when he does get across that line. Well, he's got about 150 meters to go, and he can take his time. He'll make it. He's got help there. So, David Wyatt. Okay. Great, Connor. Let's, help let's, uh, towards let's the fade line. out now and uh, go back to John. Now, um, John, tell us what was happening there, who was involved, and why it's important to your argument about leadership. Yes, I love that. I've, I've used it in teaming training in the past. I, I just love it. This David Wyeth, um, um, who helped out Matt Reese. Matt Reese is the person who looked like he was going to die. Um, and the idea that somebody stopped, I think, is, is remarkable. These are the people think leadership is about these big, profound moments, but this is only a big, profound moment because it happened to be caught on camera. But if it hadn't have been, this just would have been a nothing, a, a nothing. I love the idea that leadership is, is the idea of a perpetual state of calculated selflessness. The idea that in order for you to win and prosper in the long term, I'm not quite sure it's an infinite game, but it's a long game. You need to know when you sacrifice in the moment they're not even on the same team, but I know that when it comes to that young man, when it comes to David Wyeth, I, I can have an expectation of a different kind of experience if I'm on his team. There's something that he has built that is powerful with this demonstration that there are things that are more important than winning in this moment. When you hear them in an interview afterwards, um, once this man has been rehydrated, 
um, they'd have this lovely, very British interaction where they both apologize to each other and they both thank each other and and he talks about, David Wyeth uh, talks about the fact that other people might have stopped but you stopped and I just thought that's a wonderful crystallization of what leadership is other people might have done something but you did something and what, what you see if you watch that video and I, I often play it two or three times for people and go through step by step is the number of opportunities to leave he had. There's another tam man who comes who um, to, uh, to pull him off. And he's like, no, this is my job. I have taken this on. I will take this man to the line. There's another one who tries to pull him off so he can't finish the race. He says, no, this man will finish the race. I love that. But it's what's so interesting about your, the way you've described it, John, is um, that it, you, know, it, you, 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 you frame it as, a, as an act of leadership, not just of compassion. And obviously there is huge compassion there, but it's, but it's a, an act of leadership as well, which I think is... Um, I also want, wanted to, do, again, you know, the, 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 there's, there's a lot of, of, of very deaf use of language in the book. And, and, and one of the things I, I, I was struck by was your distinction between groups and teams. Now, we hear a great deal about groups nowadays. Um, why is a group different from a team? Um, because a team is an earned title, or at least it should be. I know that many of you who are in organizations, you will be told that you're on this team or that team, a project team or a whatever, sales team. But it's an earned title. Most people have never been on a team. Most people have never been on a team. That leadership uh, statement, a, a, a perpetual state of calculated selflessness, that is what applies to teams. That's what, they are so energy expensive. It's telling somebody, so my geek squad, that's my team of psychologists, um, telling them that, they're, that you have earned the right to be a team is because each one of them knows that they have a responsibility. They are accountable for their own outcomes. And yet in every moment, I expect them to be looking left and looking right metaphorically to their teammates and in advance of being asked to be ready to support or challenge in equal measure so it's not just about helping people out but it's about when you see your teammate who's flagging and you're really focused on getting your thing done you know you still have to take time out from doing your thing to say hey Lindsay pick it up you've got this pick it up and then you've still got your own accountability it's so effortful that most people don't bother because you can do really well as a, as a group of elite individuals. You'll simply get your ass kicked by a team when they come along. Um, I wonder if we could come to uh, Tom McCallum, uh, who I know uh, Tom, had a, a question to ask. Tom, hi, how are you? Hi, Emma. Um, um, far away. Well, um, evening, John. Good to see oh, you. Good to see you, uh, Tom. The bit that struck me most in listening to your book was the combination for leadership of juxtaposition of being bold and vulnerable. And you also talked about one of the things that you, that giant leaders will do is to be, and I won't get your words exactly correct on this, but to be really clear and concise with their vision. So, you had a very successful first career in sports and I would put it to you with a, some degree of knowledge that you're at the top of your game in your current career and you're just getting started at the because you're a few years younger than me so I wonder if you'd like to say something to this group about what your next bold and vulnerable vision is Oof. so Tom, Tom, is a, Tom is a plant from social media. We know each other from, from social media. We chat there a lot. Um, I, I, what is my next thing? Um, there is no new normal. It's a lie that people tell you because the alternative is effortful. I want to be 
No, I want my team to be the Sherpas in this journey to what is new. I want us to be prescient as we have been in the past on some of the shifts and changes. I want us to help um, leaders to really master themselves so that they do no accidental damage and can help people thrive without breaking. Um, that's what I want. I look with envy, and, and I say this, um, it's a little embarrassing, but I look with envy at some of the gurus out there, and, and I can genuinely say I have no interest in becoming a guru. I like being a psychologist. I think it has a little more credibility. It doesn't pay as well. But I am interested in, I want my team and I to be the go-to people. Right now, I think we're the third person with the third organization. You go to one of those big companies, then you go to one of those big boutiques. And when both of them have failed, you come to us with no budget. <laughs> and, and I want people to realize that my team is awesome, weird and wonderful, and that we can help guide you. We cannot carry you, but we can help guide you to the new. There's some uh, fascinating names being proposed in the chat, John, for uh, potential or past lead leaders, ranging from Angela Merkel to Paddy Ashdown, uh, Andy Burnham. I wanted to come to Susie Kershaw, who I think had a really interesting question about a particular individual and whether or not that individual counts as a leader. So. Um, Hi, Susie, great to see you. Over to you, because I don't want to ask your or make your point for you. Is this about the, the young person I was mentioning? It was it was about uh, the, the, the well-known climate activist. Yes, I, I, I'm just listening about the, the concept of, of leadership, and I, I, I could go off in a million directions, um, because one point I also wanted to ask was when and how you learnt being big and being a giant and being disproportionate was a positive thing. I'm a tall woman and so this is an absolutely riveting question for me. But the other point that I did put into the chat, which um, Matt's referring to, is in all of this um, lists of people and the qualities about leadership, where does Greta Thunberg sit in your experience, in your opinion and in your you. That's a good question. Where does Greta Thun I, I cite Greta Thunberg quite often. Um, I think she is clearly a leader. Um, she has clarity and direction. She has stood staunchly against powers that work to crush her. She is, you know, people talk much about her, her position on the, the autism spectrum, uh, I think often without much insight, but she appears to me in the writings that I have seen and, and her responses on social media that she is both approachable and emotionally literate. She is certainly empowering to an entire generation and not just young people. As staunch and strident as she is, she, as stark as she is with the reality, she grants hope. Yeah, I would call her a leader. Um, to answer your second question, um, I have known my whole life, this is perhaps different for you tall women out there, but I have known my whole life that I am a monster. I know that I'm a monster. I know because people are afraid of me and they run away. I know because I have done events in person with people where they have clapped and then I have walked out of the arena or the venue and it has been dark and they have crossed the street to avoid me. I'm not sure that I will, before I pop my clogs, really come to peace with the idea that I am not a monster. But what I know is that if I am thoughtful and careful if I arrange the world around me in such a way that I present safety, 
that I can be a great protector, I can be a good teacher, and that, you know, maybe there are lessons monsters can teach. Thank you, thank you. Um, I want to come to um, someone who, uh, a colleague of mine, a fellow editor and partner, who's actually, um, that she'll probably hate me for saying this, one of the best leaders I've encountered in 30 years in media, that's Liz Mosley. Um, Liz, you have made some points in the chat and as ever, th there's no point in trying to paraphrase Liz Mosley. It's, a, it's, a, it's our fool's errand. So tell us what you're thinking about all this. You, you, you've mentioned a number of names and yes, yes, yes. You, you've got some generic points to make and I'd, I'd, I'd love you to rehearse some of them. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, hi, John. Um, uh, so uh, first of all, to Susie Kershaw, who is a fellow tall woman, I just put I feel like I, I would like to tick a box to say I'm a tall woman too, but that's never a thing. <laughs> Being a tall woman is definitely experience that I would like to talk to other tall women about. And um, people respond to you in a very particular way when you're a woman and you're sort of bigger than women are meant to be, I guess. Um, I, uh, as, as somebody who finds themselves, John, only recently, um in public i i have this job at tortoise i'm sometimes on the screen i do thinkings like this sometimes and write emails to members i'm of very little consequence in the grand scheme of things un unlike yourself and have achieved very little however i find myself with people listening to me in public for the first time and um for a year it sort of was kind of exciting it was kind of fun and i enjoyed sort of developing, I think people call it a voice, a perspective, I don't know what they call it. And then suddenly, um, I had a sort of hit a rocky patch, personally, professionally, had a couple of Twitter pylons, and I feel really crippled by that experience, because I sort of feel a responsibility, I have a platform, right, I, I feel I have a responsibility to do the right thing. And I it is difficult to um, be brave. And I wonder, I suppose it's a two part question to someone like yourself who has, you're legit, you know, you're the real deal. You've done the things, you've put in the work, you've, you've eaten the Greg's pasties, you've been, you've been the star and you're now running a business. Um, and I, I guess one, one is how, how, do you how do you stay humble when you are so wise? And the sort of corollary of that question is how how do you stay brave when you're constantly terrified of putting your foot in it? So no, no, that's a that's a Twitter-sized answer right there, isn't it? So how do you stay humble when you're so wise? It just feels awful. Um, my wisdom is borrowed. I read a lot. And a lot of my wisdom comes from science fiction, Asimov especially. Um, but also Star Trek. And also Star Wars. Uh, you don't have to love one or the other, just for the record. Um, I don't believe in humble. I am quite vociferously against it in the book. I think humility is... I don't know if we're allowed to swear on this, but in the book, I just say humility is bullshit. Because it is. It, it's just bullshit. I, I, and I, am an, I understand completely that many of us grew up... I, I, this, there are black and brown people especially who grew up in households where humility was a preordinate requirement women told humility a preordinate requirement many men kind of optional um but it's just bullshit i don't want people to lie to me i don't want my colleagues to lie to me and i don't want my friends to lie to me if i ask you what you are good at if you tell me you are not good at something that you are actually great at, that is no less a lie than telling me you are great at something you are actually not. I want, it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm not advocating um, uh, 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 grandiosity, I'm not advocating bravado and, and, and that kind of extreme, but I'm advocating objectively. Liz, there are things that you are remarkable at. And part of what helps you stay resilient in the face of idiocy 
and attack is being secure in the knowledge of what you're brilliant at, not shying away from it, not attenuating it, no caveats. Just know that when those people pile on, I've been there with you for those pylons, when they pile on, they don't know you. They are a stranger with a point to make. They are point dry scorers. As a bone here. Sorry, that's my my parent, my my computer dries a bone. Um, they are they are strangers with a, with a point to score, and they cannot, with their words on Twitter or LinkedIn or anywhere else, attenuate or remove the skills and capabilities you've earned over a lifetime. That's what I bear in mind. That, and the fact that. I am fortunate that I can close my eyes in the midst of the most dreary times and I can recall the person who when they looked at me they reflected back my potential and I knew exactly who I was and that can be helpful and perhaps it's a partner for some people perhaps it's a good friend or a colleague for me it's my mum I remember the way she looked at me and no amount of vitriol on social media can penetrate that so true. So true. Thank you, John. Um, I wonder if we could come to Patricia Hamzawi, um, uh, who had had a very interesting point. Hi, Patricia. How are you? Hello. How are uh, you? You raised uh, very early on in the chat, and I, I wanted to come to you uh, very much um, about, which is sort of um, connected again to a very topical question uh, to do with, um, I suppose. The, 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 the point where iconic status and leadership uh, meet and, and something that's happened in, in, in the last 24 hours in the Olympics. And I just wondered if you could pose that question or, or make your point to John about it. Yeah, absolutely. I really want John's perspective. Uh, but first of all, I have to say my dad is a six foot six black man and my mom is a four foot five Japanese lady. So I'm sympathetic with everything that's going on. Anyway, my question, John, you are an athlete and a leadership specialist. So I really wanted your thoughts on what has happened with Simone Biles having to step away from, from the Olympics for her mental health. Should she, as some people are tweeting and comparing, persevered as a great athlete and just gone out there and did the job? Or was she right and brave to take care of herself? <clears throat> I think that corpulent former broadcasters should keep their opinions to themselves. I think that few people can have access. I, I, I am a, a former athlete and I am nowhere near, not even close to the caliber of a Simone Biles. I, I, I cannot conceive of the efforts that she has gone to or the ingenuity that she's shown with her performances and indeed her brand mastery. What I do know is that in the workplace, one of the things, one of the facets of the future world of work is going to be redressing the imbalance about resilience, re removing the nonsense description of resilience that we currently have. Because resilience is about, the research originally was done on prisoners of war. It was done on the children of uh, uh, parents with acute psychiatric disorders. It was on the survivors of abuse. So resilience research was actually about your ability to survive trauma, not your ability to bounce back from adversity. To have the world watching you, expecting with every move you make, you will escalate and raise the game is a challenge that few of us could master. And if an individual is smart enough, insightful enough, introspective enough to know that a further foray into this in this moment could break them then they should be congratulated then they should be congratulated because that's a good example the workplace of the future is one where people are pushed they are stretched so that they are sore the next day but they are never broken and if this young woman can assess that this might break her and she's smart enough to step away so that she can be in the long game, then she should be congratulated. 
I think she's remarkable. And a role model too. And a giant. John, you, you, you say in the book, which is sort of pertinent to some of this, you know, and indeed the last point, that in a funny way, the destination uh, is, uh, is oftentimes incidental. It's the journey that, 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 that what really matters and what counts is, is, is what you do while you're getting there. So you don't regret for a minute that you're, you, you found this extraordinary life in basketball and everything that's followed it. But the, 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 the point was that it, it wasn't make or break that it was basketball. It was the, the things that that led you to experience and the, the, the vitality that that gave you. And again, that's a very that that that's almost countercultural because the, the the thing we tell young people is isolate a, something you're good at, find a dream, you know, before you've gone into secondary school, pursue it to the uh, to, to, to the limit of your physical and mental capabilities. Obviously, you're not saying don't work hard, but what you are saying is that. That, that the isolation of, of, of a dream or the isolation of a specific idea is not the key, which I find fascinating. Yeah, we, we aren't what we do. Our occupation is not our definition. And the more kind of weird the job, the worse that can be. People often wonder why do professional athletes seemingly invariably disappear into some form of self-medication, whether it's gambling or drink or something else. Well, if, you're, if you are what you do and your career stops, you become what? A stranger to yourself. I, I often tell people I was a psychologist that played basketball. Um, but that's because I realize how stupid basketball is as a job. It's not that it's, it lacks meaning uh, for people who observe, but I put a ball in a hole for 20 years. When you boil something down to its core components, it becomes uh, a little less pithy, I think. We have to spend more time learning who we are going to become and how we're going to get there if we want to have lives that feel fulfilled at the end. Otherwise, we will simply invest and invest and invest and squash ourselves into the shape of a role or a job description rather than being a more complete faceted multi-dimensional weird individual yes and i suppose as well that we're we're going to by virtue of of, of greater life expectancy and also the more disruptive nature of work we're going to have to pursue different avenues anyway Listen, there's research, um, uh, it's Deloitte did it, um, uh, and they were maybe two, three years ago, two, 2016, um, and they talked about the fact that somewhere between 75 and 375 million roles are going to have to change between now and 2035. So <clears throat> with that kind of disruption, the, 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 with that kind of change in in the sectors around us a, a, a surety in who we are understanding our own purpose what we aim to achieve the impact we want to have on the world is going to be more resilience enhancing in the true meaning of that word than being sure that you're an engineer being sure that you're a psychologist being sure that you're something else i think that's going to be hugely crucial moving forward I'd like to bring, if we have that time, to bring in my tortoise colleague, Luke Dama. Um, Luke, are you, are you there? Hi, Luke. How are you doing? Hi, um, yeah, I'm doing good. Uh, just wanted to um, you know, give you a chance to um, have your say because you, you know, you said some really interesting things in, in the chat, not just to do with um, your height, but also, you know, um, a question of what it means and, and, and people's reactions to it and so on. Yeah, well, I appreciate the chance. I, I think. Um, I've really just been trying to keep up with all the interesting stuff that's gone on the sidelines as, as well as listening to John, which is, uh, thanks so much, John. It's been really, really interesting to hear. What, one of the things that I was saying is that I'm physically big myself. 
Um, and whilst I, I was listening to you and felt sort of the, uh, some of the things that you were some of the some of the things that you were describing really resonated with me. But I wanted to maybe challenge, if I could, the idea that you're sort of confined inevitably to some sort of conception about yourself because of your physical size alone. And I, I was just putting in uh, there was, uh, was a little story about the fact when I was growing up, my aunt was desperate for me to have growth hormone blockers because I was projected to reach six foot eight, six foot nine, which I am now. And she thought, look, his life's going to be terrible because he's going to be looking down on people all the time. People will be afraid of him, as you described. People will think that he's abnormal, he's a monster, whatever it is. And I, I, I think I'm really glad that that didn't happen. Um, I'd, but also think it's necessary to go the step further, which is to say, look, look, you need to be wary of reinforcing the idea that it makes you a monster to be of a particular scale. Because, I, like, I, I just don't, I don't see that. And. I, I just want to raise also the nuance that like credit entirely your experience and as I would credit my own and don't think there are any hard and fast rules, but I, I did just want to, uh, to, to raise that point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, thank you for that, Luke. I, I think it's, I think it's fair that it shouldn't define, but I'm 50 years, years old. I've been stopped and searched every year for the last 34 years. I'm, I'm a nerdy psychologist with a Star Wars fetish. I am less dangerous than your average bear. My experience is driven by how people perceive me. Yes, the reason that I talk the way I do is to defeat this. The reason I used words with three syllables where one would do is this. The reason this background, even though the light is killing it right now, is constructed to help you see exactly what I need you to see. Everything about this color is tested. The way that there are the concentric circles leaving my head, the way it gets darker at the sides, less so in the middle, the way that you can see a lot more of me than you can see of most of you makes me smaller and lighter, and this color blue makes you think I'm smart. The tchotchkes in the corner are really important to me. That's a very expensive Mace Windu lightsaber. Uh, and yes, it's a replica, and yes, it works. Oh, not the cutting part, but the lighting part. And that's a Yoda, and that's a TARDIS behind my book. This is the construction that I do to make sure that people see my brain. But they don't. My neighbors wouldn't let me back into the house the other day. They said they hadn't seen me around. I told them it's because I live in the penthouse and I look into their gardens. My experience is and the experience of a myriad of black and brown people, uh, a myriad of people who have the combination of being massive, tall and black, is that the world does not look at us and say, hmm, you're a screaming intellectual, I must have you on my board. The experience of most women in this room is not, oh, you must be a strategic leader. They wonder if you're in HR or why you haven't brought the sparkling water yet. I know that this is not the world we want to have, but we don't get the world we want to have by pretending the world we have is the world we want to have. One of you will see me in central London. It'll be dark. And you will walk towards me. And before you know who I am, perhaps I'm wearing a hoodie, you will have a sense of fear grip you because every part of your socialization has told you that someone big is coming. And if you can see that I'm back, someone big and black is coming and every part of your socialization says that that's dangerous and you will be tempted to cross the street and because of this conversation, you may not. But this is the world we live in and if we want a different one, we have to address the reality and eviscerate it. Thank, thank you so much, John. Uh, tragically, we've, we're have already running over, so I have to draw proceedings to a close. But uh, I, I, I love the fact that you've uh, 
concluded proceedings with a, with a challenge to us all, and I think one, you know, uh, a, a real and practical one to go away and think about. Um, please do buy the book, everyone. It is really terrific. It will make you think, and I hope act. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. Thanks above all to to, to John, who I think has has given us a a really uh, inspiring kind of way of looking at so many things. He's a, he's a cerebral force. He's a Jedi master, and he's in every conceivable and good sense of the word a giant. And we're, we're really grateful to you, John, for your time. Um, join us again tomorrow if if you're around. We're going to close off our summer. Uh, program with um, a, a drinking, um, which will be an occasion where you can come and uh, relax and, and talk to tortoise staff. And, uh, we, you know, we, 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 we will, many of us will be there. It'll be a lovely way to, 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 to talk about what's coming and what we've done. And um, thank tortoise members for, and, and others for everything they've done uh, over the last few months. But thank you again, John. Thank you all very much for coming. And I wish you uh, the best of, um, uh, of evenings. And, and if you're going off on holiday or, or just staying at home, getting a break, uh, relax and enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thank you.